Hello, everybody. Welcome to the lectures for MA283 Linear Algebra in semester two of the 21-22 academic year. So I'm Rachel Quinlan. I'll be the lecturer for this module. I think I probably know most people from last year, but I'm very happy to meet you again. I'm very happy to work with you again this semester and looking forward to getting to know you a bit better. So the plan basically for the lectures this semester is that in week one only, our lectures will be run online. Uh, this is the first lecture, which is scheduled for Wednesday. January 12th. It's, it's pre-recorded. It's being recorded today on January 11th, Tuesday. Uh, the second lecture this week is scheduled for Friday at 11, and that will be run as a live Zoom session. So uh, and I'll, 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 I'll forward the link. Uh, so you're welcome to join us then. It'll also be recorded and posted on the course website. Okay, and as we proceed then through the semester, we will meet in person on a regular and in general in, as, as scheduled in the, in the lecture timetable. Uh, so I hope that lots of you will be able to participate in the in-person lectures. If you're not in a position to participate all the time, or even if you're consistently not in a position to participate in in-person lectures, please don't worry. I understand that. I understand that we're living in a very difficult time and that, so, and, and, and that some people may not be in a position to attend in person, either occasionally or consistently. So if so, let me know. But I will be doing my best to keep in touch with everybody, whether in person or remotely, and I'll be posting recorded versions or video versions of the lectures as we proceed through the course. And of course, we'll, we'll keep in touch and you know, be ready to adapt to changing circumstances or whatever. Okay, so our subject is linear algebra. This is our first lecture. I know that you're all familiar to some extent already with linear algebra. You've studied it during the first year course. Uh, linear algebra deals with a lot of things. It's a really huge and extensive subject and its influence and significance and relevance throughout the world of mathematics is really probably second to no other area. So it's, it, it's, it's, a, it, it's, it's sort of one of the most important and pervasive general themes throughout the mathematical sciences. So what's it about? Well, I guess the theme of our first lecture here today is to introduce the concept of a vector space. And when we do linear algebra, the environment in which we work, are called, the environments in which we work are called vector spaces. And I guess in every area of mathematics, you know, you're dealing with some particular themes and you're working in some particular environments. So for example, if we're doing calculus, then the environments that we're working in basically and the objects that we work with are essentially functions defined on the real numbers, maybe in one variable, maybe in multiple variables, but we're working with functions of the real numbers and not all functions of the real, with real numbers, but the particular ones that are amenable to the objects of calculus. So maybe with continuous functions or with differentiable functions or whatever it may be. So in linear, in linear algebra also, we're working within particular structures and within particular environments that are sort of conducive to the principles and themes of linear algebra. And basically those environments are known as vector spaces. And our goal in today's first lecture is to basically kind of become familiar with the concept of a vector space and with the examples of vector spaces that we already know and to learn a little bit of the language of the subject. Okay, so linear algebra is very intricately bound up with the theory of matrices and with the algebra and arithmetic of matrices. And I know that you've studied matrix algebra in the past, what is a matrix, how, to, how we can multiply and add and do computations with matrices, calculate inverses, and so on, study the, the algebraic and arithmetic properties of matrices. So I say the study of matrices is not the same thing as linear algebra, but, the study, but, but they're closely related, and certainly the study of matrices and the computational sort of the, the, the uh, computational machinery of matrices is one of the key tools for computation within linear algebra and also sometimes for the communication of ideas in linear algebra and indeed also for developing the theory and for, and for proving theorems. So our final comment about linear algebra and matrices is that the subject and its methods have kind of unparalleled importance in the whole, in every area of the mathematical sciences. And you know, a few examples are, you know, linear algebra is basically the sort, sort of mechanism that allows us to bring computational techniques quite often to geometry, thanks to the invention of coordinate geometry back in the 17th century or even earlier, which allows us to attach sort of geometric significance to algebraic equations and to represent very many objects and functions using matrices and their algebra. Linear algebra is also of huge importance in statistics and in any area where you're dealing with data, which basically comes in the form of sort of tables of numbers. It's extremely important in the field of combinatorics, the study of graphs and other combinatorial objects, where very often a great deal of the combinatorial information can be encoded in matrix form. 
It's extremely important in any area of applied mathematics or mathematical modeling, whether you're modeling continuous processes using, for example, differential equations, or whether you're modeling sort of discrete processes which lend themselves immediately to kind of matrix methods, you're very likely to be doing a lot of linear algebra and a lot of matrix theory. And part of the reason for this, I guess it's, matrices have the capacity to kind of model and deal with multidimensional situations by their nature. They're, they're, they're arrays of numbers that sort of capture information in, in, in multiple dimensions. And they're extremely amenable to computation, to computational techniques and to the development and implementation of algorithms. So they're just extraordinarily powerful objects within the world of mathematics. And we see some of the important applications and some of the important areas where linear algebra arises as we proceed through the course. And it's also, of course, an extremely important area in its own right, as well as having major influence and applicability in every area of mathematics. So I guess if there's one subject that uh, every mathematician needs to know, I would say even more than calculus, it's linear algebra. Okay, that's the, that's the hard sell. Let's uh, move on to figure out and to have a look at what do we mean by a vector space. Okay, so one method, one thing that I'll just mention is this, this language of vectors and vector spaces. So we're going to be talking a lot about vector spaces. And a vector space is a mathematical object that is defined by virtue of its properties. And this is something that's very common in mathematics where we give something a name and say this gadget is called a whatever if it satisfies these properties. And a vector space is an example of a type of mathematical object that's defined in that way according to certain axioms that it must satisfy. So basically it's a, it's a set which is equipped with certain arithmetic operations subject to certain properties that these arithmetic operations must satisfy. So it's an axiomatically defined object. And you know, this, this uh, practice of defining mathematical objects in terms of axioms, in terms of algebraic operations and axiomatic properties that they must satisfy is relatively modern. It sort of emerged in the last sort of 200 years or so, which is modern in mathematical terms. And it has kind of, it, and it has, it, has, it has kind of developed into the subject, for example, of abstract algebra, where I would say that Modern linear algebra is the, is, is the first step, even though it doesn't arise only in abstract contexts. So our goal today is to have a working definition of what a vector space is and have some examples of vector spaces and what they look like and how we can calculate within them and so on. So in order to define a vector space, you have to already have a system of numbers in mind. Okay, and in particular, you need to have a system of numbers in mind that forms what is called a field. So we're not doing field theory, which is another whole subject within abstract algebra, but we need to have some notion of what a field is. So in the world of linear algebra, we have some numbers that, we, that we're working with, and they're called scalars. And the set of scalars needs to have the structure of what's called a field. So the set of scalars, for example, could be the set of real numbers, okay, of all real numbers. And what it means for the set of scalars to form a field is that within the system of numbers that we're working with, we can always add, subtract, or multiply any pair of elements. And still, the result of that operation should still be within the system of numbers that we're, that we're in. And it must be possible also to divide by any non-zero element. So to divide any element by any non-zero element, and the result of that operation still should be within your system of numbers. So I don't want to sort of over kind of abstract this. There are loads of examples of fields that we're all familiar with and have been working with sort of basically all our lives. Uh, and so here, here are a few examples of, of fields. So the set R of real numbers is an example of a field. Okay, what do we say a field is? Well, a field is a system of numbers where we can take any pair of elements, add them, subtract them, multiply them, and still stay within the system. And also that we should be able to divide by any non-zero element in our system. And the result of that applied to any element should still be an element of our field. So certainly in the set of real numbers, we can add any pair of elements. The result of that operation will be still a real number. We can subtract one real number from another and we get a real number as the result. We can multiply a pair of real numbers, we get a real number as the result. And we can divide any real number by any non-zero real number and we will uh, get a real number as the result. So the set of real numbers is a field and really this would be kind of our default example as we work through the, the course. So if you're kind of, you know, if you're, just in case you're, 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 you're not immediately enjoying this, ab this abstract stuff about fields, Take the real numbers. Think of the real numbers as your working example every time the term field is mentioned. Okay, The set of positive real numbers is not a field. And the reason for that is, well, a reason for it is we can, we can add any pair of positive real numbers and the result will be a positive real number. Same for multiplication, same for division, for a non, um, 
But the thing we can't do here is subtract. So we can't subtract one positive real number from another necessarily without moving outside the set of positive real numbers. Without moving outside the set of positive real numbers, which we're denoting by R with a plus on top for positive. So for example, if we take the real number three and subtract from it the real number five, of course that is a sensible thing that we can do in some number system, but not in the set of positive real numbers. So three and five both are positive real numbers, but the difference three minus five is not. Okay, the set of integers is not a field. Okay, and again, think about that, the set of integers, so item three here, the set of integers is the set of positive and negative whole numbers and zero. So if we're in the set of integers, we can add any pair of elements together, we still get an integer. We can subtract any integer from any other, we still get an integer. We can multiply any pair of integers and we get an integer as the result, but we cannot divide one integer by another necessarily without moving outside the set of integers. So, so dividing by non-zero elements takes us outside or at least sometimes takes us outside that. So for example, if we try to divide one by three, one is an integer, three is an integer, but the result of dividing one by three is not an integer. Okay, so within the integers, we can add, subtract and multiply, but we can't necessarily divide by any non-zero element and still stay within the set of integers. And that's enough to disqualify the set of integers from the classification of being a field. Okay, the set of rational numbers is a field. So remember, rational numbers are fractions in where the numerator and denominator are both integers, and the denominator, of course, is not zero. So things like 27 over 4, 211 over minus 15, and so on. So the set of rational numbers, which is denoted by Q, is a field, and that's a very good working example of a, of a field, probably the first one that we all knew about. The set C of complex numbers is a field. Okay, within the complex numbers, we can add, subtract, multiply and divide by non-zero elements without ever moving outside the set of complex numbers. And one last example, which uh, we might mention from time to time, and there is a little bit more detail about this in section 1.1 of the lecture notes, which I encourage you to have a look at, is that if you take any prime number P, the set of integers modulo P is a field. And this is an interesting example, which you might like to think about in the context of your work last year on modular arithmetic. So we, and it's a field because all of its non-zero elements have, have inverses. We can divide by any non-zero element in there as well as being able to add, subtract, and multiply. So for any prime number P, we write FP in this course for the set of integers modulo P. So for example, F5 has elements zero. We can write zero bar if you like, one bar, two bar, three, four for the congruence classes of 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4, modulo 5, with addition and multiplication, modulo 5. That is actually an example of a field with just five elements. And there's a little bit more detail about it in the first section of the lecture notes, if you're interested in having a look at that right now. If you're not interested in having a look at it right now, don't worry too much about it. Just take some familiar example, like the rational numbers or the real numbers, as your kind of working example of a field, and we'll come back to some of these finite examples uh, a little bit later, and from time to time as we proceed through the course. So, the, so in F5, the addition and multiplication are modulo 5. That means if you want to multiply 3 by 4, for example, you multiply 3 by 4 in the integers, you get 12. Take the element of F5, which represented by 12, and that is 2, because 12 is complete to 2. Okay. So those are. That's, that's a sort of outline of what a field is. So we haven't really come to the definition of a vector space yet. We're saying that in order to talk about vector spaces, we have to already have a, a field of scalars in mind. Okay, let's just mention a couple more things on that. So here's an exercise to think about. And again, there's a little bit more detail in the lecture notes about kind of formal definition of a field, which you might be interested in having a look at. But just in terms of what we've talked about already, 
you could think about this exercise. You know, which of the following examples are examples of fields? And why or why not? So if you take the set of real numbers of the form a plus b times the square root of two, where a and b are rational numbers, so things like two plus square root of two, one fifth plus three times the square root of two, and so on, and look at the set of all real numbers that have that form. Ask yourself, could that thing be a field? If you multiply two elements in there, is the result still there? If you add two elements there, is the result still there? If you divide one element there by another, which you can do in the real numbers, is the answer that you get going to be still within this set? So that's a slightly tricky question, but it kind of resembles the question of whether the complex numbers form a field. Okay, that's one example. And I think this is a useful exercise to just kind of get yourself into the habit of thinking about you know, what a field must satisfy in terms of its addition and multiplication and subtraction and division operations. Second example, the set of complex numbers whose real part is zero. So this includes all the so-called pure imaginary numbers, which are just real multiples of i, and also the number zero. Is that a field? Okay. The set of irrational numbers, is that a field? So we've seen that the set of rational real numbers is a field. What about the set of irrational real numbers? And final example, the set of complex numbers whose real and imaginary parts are both rational. You could ask yourself if that is a field and see, see what you think. Okay, so that's just a, an exercise to think about. Okay, so now we come to the most important definition of this course and the one that we're going to be using time and time again and uh, the introduction of the, I suppose not, not necessarily the only objects that we're going to be studying, but the environments that we're going to be working in, which are so-called vector spaces. So let me mention one thing in connection with the language here, and I, which is that I know the word vector turns up in a lot of different contexts in both the mathematical sciences and also in, the, in, the, in, the, in physics and the, the physical sciences. So the thing I want to mention is that the use of the word vector here is a little bit broader than how it's used in certain other contexts, for example, in mechanics, in physics generally, and maybe even in sort of coordinate geometry. So here, a vector can really be anything. So I know that in physics, quite often, like a vector quantity is defined to be a physical quantity that has direction as well as magnitude. So for example, force or velocity. Uh, and sometimes when we're doing coordinate geometry or kind of introductory linear algebra, a vector is sort of understood as a kind of directed line segment or an arrow, which lives in the, in the plane or in three-dimensional space. And those are certainly examples of vectors in our context. But here in our situation, the word vector has a broader meaning and really we're kind of allowing the possibility that a vector could be sort of nearly any type of mathematical object. It could be a function or it could be a polynomial or it could be a matrix. Okay, so the use of the term vector here is not exactly the same as some of its other uses in certain particular contexts. It's, it's, it's broader. Uh, so that's something that is a little bit tricky to get used to sometimes when you're, you know, these, these words that are supposed to have technical meanings actually have meanings that have to be interpreted according to context. But that's something that we have to kind of grapple with and live with. So I suppose what I'm saying is, when you're studying this definition, don't come to it with the sort of preconceived notion in your mind of what a vector is, if you can avoid that, because you might need to broaden it. Okay, so a vector space V over a field F. So in order to talk about a vector space, we have to have a field in mind. Okay, and when you're first thinking about this, instead of some arbitrary field F, think about the field of real numbers. So a vector space over the field of real numbers, for example, is a set, okay, so it's not the empty set, so it has to have some elements, and it has to have some algebraic equipment that comes with it. So it's a set whose elements can be added or subtracted. Okay, so think of the integers so far. The integers could be a vector space. They're not, but we'll see why. The set of real numbers itself could be a vector space. Its elements can be added and subtracted. The other thing that has to be possible for the elements of, vector, of a vector space is that they have to be, it has to be possible to multiply them, not by each other, but by our scalars, by element of the elements of the field of scalars. So for example, if it's a vector space over the field of real numbers, its elements are some sort of objects that can be added together, subtracted from each other, and multiplied by real numbers. Okay, so it seems it's, it is an abstract description. That's what a vector space is. Okay, a system of objects that can be added, subtracted, or multiplied by real numbers. Examples of these things, luckily, are actually maybe more familiar than you might expect based on looking at the axiomatic definition. So in first, set, first example, and this is maybe kind of the most typical example that turns up, or maybe, the, or, or maybe kind of a motivating example. So here's our first example of a vector space. If we take the set R3, so R for the real numbers, 
superscript three. Okay, so this is the set of column vectors of length three. So by length three, I mean column vectors with three entries. Okay, so R3 denotes a set of column vectors of length three with over R means whose entries are real numbers. And I claim this is a vector space over the field of real numbers. So the elements of this thing are all vectors with three entries where the three entries A, B, C are real numbers. Okay, and the assertion is that these things can be added to each other, subtracted from each other, or multiplied by real numbers. And the, the way that these operations are defined is illustrated in these examples. Oh, my apologies, there's a plus missing there. So to, if you want to add a pair of vectors in R3, the way to do it, so there's, that's a plus sign, which is not very easy to recognize. It's a plus, plus sign. Try it one more time. Plus, okay, slightly better. Okay, so if you want to add a pair of elements of R3, so here are two elements of R3. Elements of R3 look like column vectors of length three. So there's one of them with entries two minus one, four, another one with entries minus three, minus five, two. If we want to add those two together, what we do is we take two plus minus three in the first entry, that's minus one. We take minus one plus minus five in the second entry, that's minus six, and we take four plus two in the third entry. And this thing, sure enough, again, is an element of R3. Okay, so we can add elements of R3 and we stay within R3 when we do that. If you want to subtract, same idea, you've got a pair of vectors in R3 that you want to, you want to subtract one from the other, so just subtract the entries in each position. You can do that because the entries line up, they're both elements of R3. We have the same number of entries in both. So when we do this, we get one minus minus two in the first position, that's three, zero minus two in the second position, minus five, minus minus seven in the third position. So that's how we add and subtract vectors in R3. If you want to multiply a vector in R3 by a scalar, and here a scalar means a real number. Okay, our field of scalars in this example is the field of real numbers. So if you have a vector, for example, an element of a vector space like zero, six, minus two, we should be able to multiply it by a scalar that means a real number like four. So all you do in order to execute that is multiply each of the entries by four. So we get four times zero, four times six, four times minus two. And that's the vector that we get. Okay, so that's probably not news to anybody. But the point, I guess, of this is that set R3 of column vectors of length three is an example of a system whose elements can be added, and added together, subtracted from each other, or multiplied by scalars, which are real numbers. So this is an example of a vector space over the set of real numbers. Okay, so that's a, that's a, that's the first example, and that's a very typical example and a very important example for loads of reasons that we will see many times as we proceed. Okay, a couple more examples, and there are a few more in the lecture notes, but here are one or two more for the moment. So a second example, the set of all so this thing is denoted by R with a superscript of N for the natural numbers. And what it is, it's set of all sequences, infinite sequences of real numbers. Okay, so, so this is a little bit different from the examples on the previous slide of the vectors of length three. Here we're talking about all infinite sequences of real numbers. So an infinite sequence of real numbers is, as you know, an infinite list of real numbers. It's uh, not exactly like a column vector because it doesn't have a last entry. Okay, but it's, 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 but, it's, but it's kind of like an infinite <laughs> column vector. So, and the way that addition of infinite sequence works is that we just add sequences term by term. So, if you have two sequences of real numbers, let's say a n and b n, are sequences of real numbers. So that means that a n is a list of real numbers that starts with a1, a2, a3, and so on, it doesn't end. And b n is another sequence of real numbers that starts b1, b2, b3, and so on. Then a n plus b n, the sequence which is the sum of those two things, its, it's uh, terms are a1 plus b1, a2 plus b2, and so on. 
Okay, so given a pair of sequences of real numbers, we can add them together and get another sequence of real numbers, you know, by just adding the terms term by term. Of course, you can't necessarily sort of physically do it because it involves infinitely many additions, but you can do it in principle. And we can say, we can talk about the sum of a pair of sequences. And if you want to subtract one from the other, the sequence, which is their, their difference, its terms are a1 minus b1, a2 minus b2, and so on. Okay, so you can subtract sequences from each other. And if you want to multiply by a scalar, so you want to multiply your favorite sequence by your favorite real number, you just multiply all the terms by the scalar. I want to mention one thing about these two examples that we've met so far, which is just a feature of them both, but it's something that's going to be important for us. So I'll just kind of float it now and let you have a think about it. Um, and that is that there is one sort of important structural difference between these two vector spaces that we've met so far. So remark, I suppose. One important difference from the point of view of you know, the theory of linear algebra, the sort of stuff that we care about when we do linear algebra, between the two examples that we've met so far, which are R3 and Rn. And what that is, there's lots of important differences depending on the kind of things you're interested in. But one that I want to mention is uh, in R3, every vector, every element, can be expressed, for example, as a sum of scalar multiples of the three vectors 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1. And these three vectors form what's known as the standard basis of R3, which we will meet many times as we proceed. And what I mean by that is, you know, if you take any vector in R3, so for example, take the vector whose entries are pi, that's a real number, 2 in the second entry, let's say, and minus 6 in the third entry. Well, that can be written as pi times 1, 0, 0, plus 2 times 0, 1, 0, plus 3 times, sorry, not 3, plus minus 6 times. Zero, zero, 001, and we can verify that easily. And so the point is, if somehow if you want to describe vectors in R3, elements of R3, you can kind of describe them all in terms of their coordinates with respect to these three so-called standard basis vectors. I'll introduce that term we, later. The, the, the concept of a basis is going to be very important for us, and we're going to talk about it a lot. And this is the standard basis of R3, but not the only basis of R3. So the point is, if you have a basis in mind like this, like the standard basis, then you can sort of interpret every element in terms of its coordinates somehow with respect to that basis. And you can write elements as sums of scalar multiples of the basis elements. So, and the difference between this example and this, the space of all infinite sequences over the real numbers, which we would call an Rn. So n sort of, uh, the n there plays the role that the three plays in R3. And what it kind of captures is that if in Rn, in an element of Rn, there's one term for every natural number, not just the first three, not just the first, second, the third term, but a term for every natural number. So for Rn, I want to make the comment that there is no finite set with this property. And this property is the property that every element, every sequence, every infinite sequence can be expressed by just taking a scalar multiple of one particular one plus a scalar multiple of a second one plus a scalar multiple of a third one, where there's a finite number of them in all. So we say we would say when we become a bit more uh, familiar with all the relevant language and terminology that Rn is an example of an infinite dimensional vector space over the real numbers, and R3 is an example of a three dimensional vector space over the real numbers. And one of our goals in the second chapter of the lecture notes will be to figure out the, the meanings of those terms like basis and dimension, which are really fundamental objects 
in the near algebra and worth spending some time getting a strong understanding of. Okay, so that's a couple of examples, R3 and Rn. Further examples of vector spaces include, for instance, things like the set of all polynomials over the real numbers, or the set of all polynomials whose degree is bounded above by some fixed bound uh, over the real numbers, for instance. So we'll see more examples as we proceed, but basically yeah, an example, a vector space is a structure in which we can add and subtract elements and in which we can multiply by scalars, where the system of scalars that we're using must form a field as we saw in the first part of this lecture. Okay, so that's the kind of unofficial working definition of a vector space. I have to confess that it's not actually a completely rigorous definition uh, because we want, we, not only do we want to be able to add and subtract elements of our vector space and multiply them by scalars, but we want those operations to satisfy certain sensible and reasonable sort of patterns of behavior. So here's a long-winded definition. I won't ask you to, to reproduce it, but I guess it's important to be aware that if we want to define a vector space and give a definition for a vector space, then that definition needs to be kind of robust enough to allow us to identify and recognize examples of vector spaces and also to identify and recognize examples of things that fail to be vector spaces, even though uh, they might kind of appear to be candidates. So that means we have to specify not only that we're able to add and subtract and multiply by scalars, but also we want those operations to kind of behave in some kind of reasonable familiar ways and to interact with each other in reasonable familiar ways, which are all specified in this list of seven properties here on this slide. So fortunately, we, we, we go through these and, and have a look at all of them, but the reality is that in most reasonable cases that you deal with, these properties are all satisfied. They're kind of, they, they sort of describe the kind of behavior that we expect addition, subtraction, and multiplying, multiplication by scalars to have. So, you know, most familiar examples, there's no problem, everything's fine. But on the other hand, if we don't specify these rules, then, we're, then, 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 then vector spaces potentially kind of admit more examples than we really want to deal with. So this is the formal definition of a vector space. And if you like, this definition is kind of like a statement of the rules of the game for linear algebra. In linear algebra, we study vector spaces. These are the, the rules that a vector space satisfies. If you're working with some object that doesn't satisfy these rules, then it's not a vector space. And what you're doing is not exactly studying vector spaces. Of course, people study lots of other things too, but these are the rules for this game of the study of vector spaces. So it's very much like talking about the, you know, the rules for a, an actual game of like chess or checkers or some board game or whatever. You know, this sort of specifies the parameters that you're working with. And if you, uh, you know, if you're not following those parameters, you're, you're playing a different game. Okay, so here it is, a vector space V over a field F is a non-empty set, which is equipped with an operation which is referred to as addition, okay, denoted with the usual plus for addition, and whose elements can be multiplied by scalars, which are elements of the field F, subject to the following rules of the game, which are called axioms. Okay, and these are all kind of reasonable things that are generally satisfied by all familiar examples, but they have to be stated, otherwise we're, we're not being specific enough about what it is that we're studying. Okay, so the first one is that addition should be commutative, that we want our addition operation to satisfy the property that u plus v should be equal to v plus u for all elements u and v. And that's certainly true for any operation that we ever, we've ever referred to as addition. Okay, so yeah, we want, we want to know that u plus v should be equal to v plus u in our, in our structure. And we also want addition to satisfy the associative property, which means that if we have three elements, u, v, and w, okay, then according to our structure, we can talk about u plus v and v plus w and u plus v, that element can be added to w. So we want the result of adding u plus v and then adding w to be the same as if we were to add v plus w first and then add u. And again, this is a, you know, a familiar property of operations that we call addition in different contexts, like in the natural numbers or the real numbers or the two by two matrices or whatever. Okay, so addition should be commutative and associative. There's no mention of subtraction so far in the definition. And that's formulated in a kind of slightly different way than just describing it as subtraction. And we say that V must have an element zero. So within the vector space V, and remember its elements here could be polynomials or there could be column vectors or there could be sequences or there could be matrices, whatever, but there's an element referred to as the zero element. And the special property that the zero element has is that when you add it to any element, you have a neutral effect on that element. So it has no effect on other elements when it's added. So like, like the number zero, like the zero matrix, like the zero polynomial, like the 
like the three, like, like the zero vector in R3, which has three entries all equal to zero. Okay, so our vector space must include a zero element. And then the way that the subtraction operation is kind of described is that for every element V in the vector space, it must have a negative, okay, an element minus V. And the property that they have in, that relates V and minus V is that when they're added together, they should give us the zero element, which is the neutral property for addition. Adding it to other things does not have an effect. So basically, this is essentially sort of the axiomatization of the assertion earlier that a vector space should be equipped with a subtraction operation because subtracting V from something means adding minus V to that thing. So once we have the zero element and the concept of this uh, kind of negative of every element, then that kind of, that's what enables the definition of the subtraction operation. If you're adding V to something, then you're, sorry, if you're subtracting V from something, then you're adding minus V to that thing. Minus V is referred to as the additive inverse of V. And the property that V and minus V have that relates to them is that when they're added together, they give us the element zero. So like the real number five and the real number minus five, when they're added together, they give us zero. Subtracting five from something means adding minus five to that thing. Okay, there are a few other things that are kind of technical details, but we should we should note them and then work away with them without having to really concern ourselves with them too much. Uh, one is just, again, we want it to be true in a vector space that if we take an element V, we can multiply it by a scalar, okay? If we have two scalars in mind, we can multiply V by one of those scalars and then multiply the result by the other one. We want that to be the same as if we multiplied V by the product of the two scalars in the first place. Okay, so basically if we've got a pair of scalars and, a vector, and an element V of our vector space, multiplying V by beta using the scalar multiplication operation and then multiplying that vector by alpha using the scalar multiplication operation again, we want that to be the same as if we had just multiplied V by the scalar alpha beta in the first place where alpha and beta were multiplied in the field of real numbers or whatever field it is. Okay, so this is referred to as compatibility of scalar multiplication with the field multiplication and it's something that you know is satisfied in all our examples we rarely have to fuss about it but it has to be noted in the, in the rules of the game. And then finally we have the two so-called so distributive laws for scalar multiplication and addition. So we want the result of multiplying the sum of two elements of v by a scalar alpha to be the same as if you've multiplied both of them separately by alpha and then added them in the vector space. So the, diff the point here is that this plus sign here is addition in the vector space. And the plus sign here is addition in the field of scalars. So they're not, they're not actually the same operation, even though they're defined, denoted with the same symbol plus. So the first one is addition in the field of scalars f and the second one is addition in the, the vector space itself so we want that if we take the sum of two vectors multiplied by a scalar alpha that should give us the same outcome as if we multiply the two vectors separately by alpha and then added them in the vector space okay and similarly if we want to multiply a vector v by the sum of two scalars we should get the same outcome as if we multiplied it separately by the two scalars and then did the addition in the in the, in, the, in the vector space V. So this addition here again is addition in the vector space V. And this addition is addition in the field of scalars F. So that is the, the technical specifications of what a vector space is. That is also the conclusion of the first lecture. And so what we're going to do on Friday is to continue with, the, with, with chapter one of our lecture notes. So chapter one of the lecture notes really sort of sets out the, the rules of the game. Uh, the kind of objects that we'll be studying. So the first kind of ingredient here is what we've seen today is the, is the definition of a vector space with some examples and the concept of a field as well, which is going to be a field of scalars. And what we're going to do next is get ourselves back on a sort of slightly more concrete footing maybe by just having a bit of a review of matrix algebra. So we haven't mentioned a lot yet about matrices. They've kind of been a, a little bit in the background. I guess we can think of our column vectors in R3 as being three by one matrices. Um, I suppose, so, the, so the, the concept of a vector space is the first kind of key conceptual ingredient for our subject and one of the first things that we need to deal with. We could have, it doesn't necessarily need to be the first thing. The other sort of key theoretical sort of pillar and also practical pillar of the subject is the algebra of matrices. So what we're going to do next is we're going to sort of leave the vector space concept slightly aside, have it in our, have it in our minds but we're going to just do a little review of the algebra of matrices in the next section. That'll be section 1.2. And then in section 1.3, we're going to study 
the problem of solving the system of linear equations, uh, which is kind of one of the fundamental problems of linear algebra. So formal definition of a vector space is the first key concept for us and the first and the, and the theme of the first lecture. Next one is a review of matrix algebra. We could have done these two things in the, in the other order. The first two lectures don't necessarily depend on each other, but I will put all these things together as we proceed through the course. So thanks very much for watching and for participating. And that's the end of the first lecture. And we will see you at 11 on Friday. Good luck, everyone.